Cu speaker, mă. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is this is uh, Babura Marial from the Forum for Digital Equality. Uh, we are based in Nepal, and we are talking about uh, legal and ethical issues of artificial intelligence in emerging economies. Let me introduce uh, our esteemed uh, panel. Uh, on this, uh, my right hand side, Professor. Uh, Excuse me. Professor Dr. Liu Chuang, uh, she is from Institute of Geographical Sciences and Natural Sciences Research, Chinese Academy of Sciences, China. And on my left hand, uh, very uh, uh, good speaker, uh, Nena is here from Oath Foundation. And uh, she'll be uh, speaking on uh, African perspective. Uh, professor will be uh, speaking on how uh, China uh, uh, emerged as a leader of, on AI technology and what are the issues uh, that relate to uh, uh, this AI technology, basically from ethical and legal perspective. And I would also like to invite uh, Professor K. Park from Korea. Uh, uh, I'm very thankful to him. Uh, he is able to join this esteemed panel. And uh, we have a remote uh, speaker from uh, Nepal. He is very young, enthusiastic, uh, uh, technology uh, developer. He is president of Robotic Association of Nepal. Uh, Bikas Gurung uh, is uh, uh, remotely speaking from developing perspective, development counter perspective. Uh, Bikas, you are also welcome to the panel. Thank you so much. This, uh, this, is, uh, this uh, workshop is organized by Forum for Digital Equality and co-organized by CCAOI India. And uh, I'm moderating on-site. I'm Barbara Morel from background. I'm a lawyer. And uh, online moderator, we have uh, Amrita Chaudhary from CCOAI uh, India and Priyates Jana from India as well. So uh, let's begin uh, with uh, uh, the issue. Professor Park, can I invite you uh, in the panel? Before uh, beginning on the content, let's have a round of applause for our esteemed uh, panelists. So, uh, uh, one interesting uh, incident uh, was there in Nepal. Uh, UNDP used a famous uh, Sophia robot on one uh, governance model uh, workshop uh, in Nepal. So, uh, that was brought from Saudi Arabia packed in a uh, uh, suitcase, and she was speaking with various people, stakeholders, and one of jo our journalist friend was uh, uh, trying to uh, have some discussion with uh, robot Sophia, with her, it was already packed again. So uh, somehow it was uh, given some nationality, citizenship, and something like that, but when he was m trying to meet, it was already packed. So uh, how this kind of legal and ethical issues is emerging uh, from use of this kind of uh, technologies, our basic uh, idea of uh, this uh, uh, workshop. Uh, rather than uh, talking more from my side, I'd like to request uh, Naina to uh, share some uh, insight on uh, the Web Foundation had uh, brilliant research on AI and use in Africa, and uh, I would like to request her to start with how, what were the major findings of uh, this research? Thank you. Naina, it's yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, and just by the way, uh, Sophia does not travel as a passenger in the plane. She travels as luggage. And uh, I hope that airline companies will not <laughs> get into this discussion. Um, it's a good thing to be here and to speak to us about emerging 
emerging technologies and how they affect us. I'm from the World Wide Web Foundation, and for those of us who know Tim Berners-Lee and the web and the vision that he has put across to the world, and as he articulated it last Monday in Lisbon during the web summit, when he was launching the principles for a contract for the web, he said, and I quote, our initial thinking was that if we bring technology to human beings, they will do good things with it. So it is still the vision that when new technologies come to human beings, we will do positive things, we will do great things with it. The Web Foundation has actually done two different studies, more than two. The original one was AI in middle and low income countries um, across the world. So we, we, had, we touched base with mostly um, users and creators in Asia and Africa. And then this particular one in Africa. Um, there is another Sophia, uh, but this one is Sophie Bot in, in Kenya. Uh, what Sophie Bot does um, is to give users um, responses on, on medical, on health issues, ex especially reproductive health. And, and if you know in Africa and many other places in the world, sexuality is not something that people like to discuss openly. And, and um, sometimes even uh, that's on one hand. And then on the other hand, um, Doctor, we don't have as many doctors that are available for us. Uh, and so what, what this uh, Sophie, Sophie Bot does is to be the, the, the doctor on sexuality. So you, of course, she doesn't take leave. She's not going away. And she gives all the, right. the, the health yeah. and reproductive advice to yeah. women. Uh, and so uh, yeah. interview, the people we interviewed who yeah. have had the, the chat, the Sophie Bot, um, telling us that Hello. this is better Hello. than having to look for a doctor, That's having to schedule an interview, and all of that. So this is one way that in, in we can Hello. use this new technology in areas where human beings are still Hello. experiencing um, uh, barriers and taboos and uneasiness, Hello. like in Hello. reproductive health. Um, uh, let me also talk to you about South Africa. Uh, no, yeah. let me use Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria has something called road pepper. Yeah. Uh, road pepper, uh, road pepper helps you to navigate the, 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 the traffic. I mean, those of you who know Lagos or who've heard or been to Lagos, um, Lagos is over 20 million and the roads are not that easy to navigate. And there is the, the, the joke that you could see someone, um, uh, put the, 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 the mouse or the, the moose on the mustache, did no. a shaving, clean it up, and he's yeah. still, the car has still has not moved. So you can do a lot of things in traffic in Lagos. But road preppers um, is a solution that helps you um, navigate um, around traffic in Nigeria. Um, it, it picks, of course, it picks data from Google Maps and, on, and street maps and all of that and basically directs you about where, how you can do traffic uh, better. Um, I cannot not talk about agriculture. Uh, agriculture is um, one way that Africa is using and can use more of, of artificial intelligence. Um, we, I can maybe share Zenus. Zenus um, helps uh, Hello. agriculture people make decisions. It, it takes images and allies it with data and then advises people on, on how to do this. Uh, there are quite a number of orders in science. There are quite a number of other um, uh, good cases um, uh, of use. But generally, uh, I, can, I can say that uh, the areas where we would want to see more or we'll be using more uh, in public service. I think we, we may come back to that later. In agriculture, in health, uh, both these are very uh, important uh, things. Uh, applications, if I may use that. These are very important applications. The last one that I want to, since we are here at UNESCO, is in language diversity. Uh, um, I speak, if anyone has met and 
an African who speaks only one language, it means that African does not live in Africa. Uh, because you, there isn't any way an African can live in Africa and speak only one language. It's simply impossible. I speak about five or six. Yeah. Uh, so uh, language translation, language facilitation uh, among Africans in Africa or outside of Africa is one way that artificial intelligence is seriously being used uh, across Africa. And I think that being here in UNESCO, we would want to uh, ra raise that as, as because, I mean, multilingualism and diversity is one of the things that we, we fight for. Uh, and if the web and if technology should be hashtag for everyone, uh, then it means that uh, multi multilingualism and diversity should be those that are, are, are near to our heart. So in, in general, artificial intelligence is being used in Africa, okay. it's still being scoped, it's still being uh, studied, and, and I'm happy mm -hmm. to be on this panel to hear more from everyone as we go into the analysis. My five no, minutes are done. Thank you. Now, uh, let's move to uh, uh, Professor Chong. Uh, she has uh, a PowerPoint presentation, and uh, can we adjust that? gentlemen I'm uh, very happy uh, to, to be here share the information about the AI uh, in China so I use this uh, uh, the, this uh, term is advantages and the challenges uh, it's a brand new very new uh, issues uh, uh, AI uh, is coming in China it's, uh, this is a very uh, hot topic now very hot uh, not only uh, uh, is university, not only government, and not only uh, the campus, uh, but uh, uh, everything. Uh, I take the uh, examples here, uh, how used uh, AI, uh, uh, some, uh, some cases. One uh, is uh, AI in earthquake monitoring. So China the, uh, in the earthquake uh, uh, monitoring system, they use this AI uh, for reporting the earthquake in, in the world. Uh, mostly uh, in the five minutes, four minutes, three minutes, and then got the, the report. So that is uh, one uh, is in, uh, in uh, November, uh, in this year in Chile. Another one uh, is in Romania. And then, uh, no, uh, okay, that's uh, uh, in, uh, in Haiti, and then Tajikistan. Uh, uh, so uh, each uh, earthquake happened, and uh, only a few uh, seconds, and then report auto automatically comes. So this is uh, useful for the uh, disaster uh, in the rescue, and then uh, for the uh, uh, decision making. And then uh, this another another case uh, is uh, AI in uh, uh, drones and uh, um, uh, unmanned vehicles. So there, China has a big uh, uh, campus, company. They uh, made the uh, called uh, Da Jiang, uh, use the uh, uh, drones. Uh, and then uh, and, uh, the, the, the vehicle, uh, the car, uh, also try now. And I think it's the beginning. Uh. Another case uh, is a restaurant. In the AI in restaurant, there's uh, uh, no, no people, no only services here. Everything is uh, automatically. So you just uh, come in and nobody there. Uh, so you can order anything uh, and then service come to you. Uh, can, the, the, the robot will come to you, uh, serve for you, okay. Uh, and another one uh, is the port uh, in, the, in the port. And, uh, and this is the Qingdao. Uh, China has three uh, is AI uh, port in China. One is Qingdao, another Shanghai, and another in the uh, Xiamen. Mm -hmm. This uh, Qingdao is the uh, uh, earliest, uh, most earliest uh, AI port of China. It's uh, 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 operated uh, in July last year. So, uh, and then uh, 
350,000 containers uh, in, in the Qingdao. So all, the, all this kind of so those uh, uh, computer, uh, rubber uh, works, no any uh, people, even one. Uh. So, uh, and another one in the Shanghai, uh, 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 Shanghai airport, uh, the Sh Shanghai port. This is the biggest AI port of the world. Uh, this launched in the December uh, last year. Uh, it will reach uh, uh, 42 million containers per year uh, in the coming five years. So, uh, so it can vary a lot uh, in, in, in Shanghai. Yes. So, uh, so this is uh, uh, AI is coming in China. So not only uh, the, the, this side, uh, but the university students and so on, they, they try to, to learn. So AI applications uh, become a very, very hot topic uh, in almost all fields. All uh, AI-related subjects are also coming to heart, including big data, cloud computing, and AI science and technology. So, but the AI comes, but new problem comes, and also, of course, opportunities. So, because the AI, everything AI, and the people lost job. So, because China has a huge people, but uh, people lost job, couldn't find. Uh, so, this is a big problem. And, uh, uh, and also, the less knowledge and the skill for the new position. If you have new job, but uh, no skill, uh, or without any uh, uh, knowledge about that. So, so how to do, so how to get the solution? Uh, solution uh, is go to the education. Uh, so whether uh, education can help. So this is a challenging for education. So in, the, in university, the, no such kind of uh, the, uh, subject uh, uh, classes. So this is a, this is a pr pr problem. So government asked uh, university to open this class, but uh, no teacher. But our teacher said, uh, Okay, I, I try to, to teach, but no materials, no books. So this is everything is new. So no enough teachers, uh, less reading materials and the books, and the new classes should be arranged and even more other things uh, and uh, many uh, challenges. But of course, uh, this is opportunity. But now this is China now. So, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Now, uh, let's move to a small, uh, tiny economy, Nepal, my own country. Uh, it's uh, very uh, in between uh, two giants, China and India. Uh, but uh, uh, we have very young in, uh, entrepreneurs, we have young tec uh, technical people who has been trying to uh, uh, mark their presence in AI technology. Uh, uh, because are you hearing us? Uh, can you share your presentation in, in five minutes? Uh, your, uh, this is your initial right. uh, presentation. I'll come back after on that. Sure, I can definitely hear you. Can you hear me too? Yes, we can. Can you hear me too? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, we're, we're, uh, can you? Uh, we're sharing your uh, slides as well. Slides. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, thank you, Babaram sir, for providing me this opportunity. So that I can explain the whole world how Nepal is in terms of AI Just and so what, are the, status, uh, what are the status, what are the problems of your slides. Sure. Uh, uh, I have already sent you the slides. Can you? Go ahead. Yeah, I can. Uh... Okay, uh, it's my slide on. I can see my face here. Let's go on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. So this is Bikas, uh, the president of Robotics Association of Nepal. 
Uh, today, I'm going to talk about what are the present contexts, what, what is the AI's impact, the challenges that we are facing, and what are the strategies to make AI feasible for us. So, uh, if we talk about the progress in uh, Nepal, how AI has uh, been here, uh, there has been a multinational company, Fuse Machines, that has been leading uh, AI revolution, and a uh, follow up is done by uh, lots of uh, community organizations like AI for Development, AIN, Ampersept, uh, Pilot Technologies, Cloud Factories. There has been lots of uh, training going on so, to build the capacity. And on uh, daily life level, so bank has been uh, using AI technology so that they could provide service mm -hmm. for 24 mm -hmm. hours, uh, such as Mata Putre. And uh, there has been a CAG, uh, cash recognition technology that has been built for visually impaired. Uh, there is a, another technology that has been built, a geocracy, which can provide smart data-driven agricultural intelligence system. There has been also emergency response, uh, drone-based delivery uh, system, a robot restaurant. So there are lots of them uh, regarding how AI has impacted on Nepal. If we talk about uh, Siri, basically Kathmandu, then uh, it seems like Kathmandu is very technology driven. But when, it, when we talk about whole Nepal, then it has created a huge digital divide. So that's where like uh, lots of challenges has emerged here in Nepal as well as uh, people has been, uh, whole Nepal has been saying, uh, development inequality. Since we have been uh, a lagger in terms of AI or robotics technology, uh, the development has been slowly progressing. And economic unbalance, as you can imagine, uh, all the services uh, that has been com coming up to the people in terms of technology is by built by China and US. So the economy, the wealth that could uh, be generated is not for the emerging economies like Nepal. So that has been one of the uh, challenge. There has been a knowledge gap. You know, this technology is not built here. So people are uh, trying so hard to get up on the technology, but they, there are like a lack of resources, lack of uh, access to technology, which is making even also the employment worse. You don't have a good human resource that could uh, support the AI-based uh, project development. And also, uh, we are facing biased algorithms uh, that uh, do not lead us to what uh, Nepal's choices. You have to uh, face uh, developed countries' uh, prospects. So that has been one of the challenges. But if we talk about uh, ethical challenges, uh, in current scene, like uh, for private sector, there has been a uh, issue of accountability. The employees that uh, these multinational companies or local companies hire break uh, NDAs, and you cannot um, uh, take legal charges against them. They do not uh, take uh, ethical decision; like they have to follow the rules, but they are not doing it. Competencies, the foundation is so weak, and uh, when we try to build them, uh, build them, their competency uh, competency is not up to the level, and also the turnover, uh, they are switching from one company to another, and uh, that's uh, totally unethical. You know, you have a contract for two years, and you just turn from one company to another. For public sector, uh, lack of awareness. So it's also kind of a ethical issue because you don't know if uh, the person who is expert on AI is uh, providing you the right solution, if he is doing a, a good job or wrong one. So that has been a, one of the issues. Uh, when we talk about employer as well, uh, they uh, think like it's a monotonous job and uh, they feel like uh, I'm bored with this and they do not uh, complete the task as well. Uh, from the community sector, leaders with basic knowledge tools are there. Basic knowledge. You don't, you cannot lead 
high-end technology with just a basic knowledge, but they are doing it. So it's kind of uh, also ethical based and uh, lack of data availability. Uh, in terms of uh, government sector, uh, they are also not aware of, about this technology. When we talk about robotics and AI, uh, they feel you know nervous. And uh, they are also kind of scared uh, because of unemployment that will create due to the AI. So uh, they are not uh, getting ready to implement this technology. So when we talk about legal challenges, uh, private sector is not aware about the government plans and policies. You never know what kind of legal complication would come from government. Government even doesn't know what kind of legal rules they can implement. Uh, for public sector, uh, who are on the um, starting phase of AI-based companies or uh, initiatives, uh, they don't have a normal company registration. So they are facing hustles to go from one uh, uh, government agencies to another. So how can we uh, possibly uh, reduce these kinds of uh, challenges uh, from government pr perspective, what I had seen so far after the having discussion with the government agencies and public sector. So public-private partnerships would help a lot in forming a strong plans and policies. So this will create ethical and legal framework, uh, which will support, uh, which will reduce the challenges. Governments focus AI program. Well, I had a meeting with this uh, secretary of ministry and what he suggests was, what if uh, we could come up with some kind of framework from international level and uh, that could be adopted here as well. So uh, if we could uh, focus on governance uh, pro based AI program, then that could also help uh, reduce a uh, robotics and AI technology based department as well. So uh, China has already adopted um, uh, ministry for AI. So if there could be department uh, in government. Can you uh, be a brief? Yeah, sure. Uh, robotics and AI uh, based uh, department, that could be perfect. So in terms of uh, a private, uh, perfect implementation of a uh, uh, legal framework uh, would uh, support them. Uh, ethical knowledge, uh, so if uh, transferred to each and every uh, private companies, then uh, this could also work. Uh, also to the employees and uh, technology and knowledge transfer as well. Like uh, technology are being built in China and US. So if, if it could be transferred here as well, then that could also support uh, ethical performance. Uh, efficiency enhancement, enhancement based uh, AI product could also let public uh, feel that, okay, this is a, a boon for them. This is an opportunity for them. And also access and availability to the public. Uh, to resources and technology. And one of the things that Nepal is lagging on is AI education, though there has been some community uh, initiative. So AI-based uh, education for the community people so that we can create a huge mass, it would also work. So uh, 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 that Thank you very much. I'll come back uh, to you on uh, next round. Uh, now I'll go to uh, Professor Park. Uh, Professor Park is uh, having uh, uh, experience on technology and legal issues, various research and uh, public interest litigation as well. Uh, he's from Korea and I would like to request, uh, we have heard about the use of uh, AI technology and uh, from um, uh, African perspective, from developing country perspective and, and uh, Chinese perspective, uh, a, uh, a developed country in AI, uh, I should say like, uh, like that, and a small economic perspective from Nepal. So uh, what you see uh, the major legal and ethical issues in, in AI implementation, uh, Professor Park? Uh, those of you who cannot find my name in the program, you are not doing anything wrong. Uh, I was not planning to uh, speak here. Uh, I uh, was subbed in um, by my good friend. Uh, actually, five minutes before the session began. Uh, because uh, uh, some uh, uh, other panelists could not uh, make uh, due to visa problem, I believe. Uh, which uh, shows uh, uh, another 
big uh, uh, divide yeah. between the south and north because it's usually the panelists from the south that have uh, this visa problem at the last minute. Um, I will uh, not do a PowerPoint presentation. I just put it up there just to, <laughs> well, it's, it's there already. Uh, just, just so that you, you, you know my name. Um, uh, so uh, I think that there are largely uh, four different uh, sets of ethical issues uh, arising out of AI. One is what I would call anthropomorphic. Um, basically, what distinguishes AI from the previous technology is that it challenges the concept of humanness. So um, whether AI is considered a human being or not, uh, it will change our analysis of uh, uh, freedom of speech uh, and also privacy. A uh, few years ago, until a few years ago, Google used to have this service where a machine will read the contents of your email and attach uh, related uh, advertising uh, links. So if I write an, if I write, if I write a Gmail to my friend saying oh, let's go for wine, then the email will include the, uh, links to uh, best wine shops nearby. Uh, Google did that, believing that having machine read the contents of email does not infringe privacy, and civil society didn't know how to respond to that either. Uh, the issue went away unresolved when Google uh, stopped the services. But Google is still having machine uh, read the DNA fingerprints of uh, video files attached to email, emails. Uh, and when they uh, identify child pornography, uh, about three years ago, they actually reported to the police the sender of that email. Um, so having machine in there, in your private space, having an, an object, inanimate object in the private space, does that violate your privacy if uh, there is no human being actually uh, uh, absorbing that data produced by that object? If there is a if there's a, I mean, if there's a dog walking into your sour booth, do you consider it a privacy violation? If there's a person walking in, you, you definitely see it as a privacy violation. How about a bottle of soap in your sour booth? Uh, similar issues arise out of uh, freedom of speech, depending on whether you see it as a, uh, uh, see AI as a human being or not. Uh, you all know that <coughs> intermediary safe harbor, in, oh no, intermediary liability safe harbors uh, have been the uh, legal tools to uh, encourage and promote the growth of, uh, uh, the growth of civic space uh, on the uh, internet. Now, the, one of the reasons that we uh, promoted this intermediary liability safe harbor was a belief that if we, if we hold intermediaries, you know, like Google, Facebook, liable for unknown contents, then they'll start pre-approving the contents posted on their services, and that will be tantamount to prior censorship. And prior censorship in the legal field and in the human rights field is a no-no. Uh, so, but how about, how about that pre-approval is not done by human beings, but done by machine? What if uh, uh, Google or Facebook comes up with uh, AI technology that filters out fake news? Um, and if uh, they have the technology, then now it takes away the legal argument 
for having intermediate reliability safe harbor. So I'm sure the policy people in those companies are really in really difficult situation because the more capability they develop for the detecting illegal content on not, uh, online by machine learning will actually strengthen the reason for taking away the safe harbor for their intermediate liability. And I'm a, I have been a free speech advocate for many years and I cannot imagine a world without intermediate liability safe harbor. So that's one set of issues which I call anthropomorphic issues. It arises out of um, it, 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 arises, uh, it arises out of uh, uh, this challenge, this, this dilemma about whether AIAs should be treated as a human being. Can you go to, since we have the slide on it, can you go to slide number 17? <laughs> I only have five minutes, so this is the only way I can keep within, keep within time. Uh, so that's one set of issues that I just dealt with. The second set of issues is economic issues. Uh, we already talked about it, talked about it. robots replacing humans uh, in jobs. Uh, so, you know, just like uh, in capitalism, the ones who had uh, capital, uh, you know, could uh, exploit uh, uh, other people uh, making people dependent on the use of the capital to uh, uh, create uh, value. Um, and as uh, uh, robots uh, uh, start providing labor that uh, replace uh, human labor, uh, there will be more inequality. Uh, the third, now I, I keep saying, I keep adding one because I talked about anthropomorphic issue already. The third is algorithmic. Um, so you all know about uh, how uh, banks uh, will, uh, you know, use algorithm to uh, uh, so that uh, poor people will have uh, less chance getting loans. Uh, but if you think about it, it's not really AI problem; it's a human problem because. Uh, uh, you know, human loan officers will also uh, reject uh, loan applications from poor people. And AI trained on that data uh, will uh, continue to do that. So it's not really AI problem, it's uh, intensifying human bias through uh, automation. The fourth issue, uh, the fourth uh, ethical challenge of AI uh, comes from data monopoly. Um, AI is like software, you know, it's like Windows. Uh, it can be copied. Uh, a lot of people can have copies of uh, uh, AI. Uh, what really distinguishes, uh, what really makes or breaks is not whether you have the software, but whether you have the training data. Um, and uh, uh, who is collecting the training data, who is building the silos of training data, um, that will also, uh, that will also uh, decide a lot of things in resource allocation and resource uh, distribution. Um, so these are the challenges. I have answers, my answers to each of the challenges but I'll get to them on the next round. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Park. Uh, one question, do you think uh, we need any uh, legislative uh, development on uh, governance of AI? Or uh, what do you think? It's just a, a technology, we don't need a specific uh, new uh, uh, legislation or what? Hmm. Uh, sorry, I, I mean, do we need legislation <coughs> to legislate? Do you want to uh, legislate AI technology or uh, let's uh, uh, keep uh, going uh, development of AI without any new uh, uh, AI governance uh, le from legal perspective? Well, uh, you are kind of like coaxing me into giving up my, <laughs> uh, uh, disclosing my answers early. 
Uh, out of the four challenges, uh, I think the real challenge is the fourth one, um, data monopoly. Uh, I think that on that issue, I wish there are more legislative efforts to uh, not to force people back into you know this uh, uh, this uh, castles of uh, uh, privacy uh, where people don't share data with uh, anybody. Uh, but I wish there are more legislative initiatives that encourage people to share more data with one another but equitably. Um, for instance, if there is a, a lot of data being uh, put into silo without any compensation, uh, maybe we can make laws that encourage uh, those silos to be shared with uh, a lot of other people so that they can also use that data uh, for training AI so that they can also benefit in you know, making a living or uh, researching. Um, so that's kind of a line of thought that I would call data socialism. Uh, I know that socialism uh, has a, a bad name in other parts of the world, but probably a relatively good name in Europe, so uh, I have no problem saying it. So. Nena, you want to say something? Yes, I do. I think there are people here who are older than myself. Who remembered when television was the newest technology in town? Good. Everyone here remembers when mobile, techno mobile f telephony was the big deal. Who remembers that? Right. Your children will have to visit a landline, a phone landline in, in the museum because that would be like so old. But some of us here remember when telephony itself was the new technology. I don't think we have a problem with artificial intelligence as a technology. Ultimately, it's a human issue. It is still what human beings do with technology. In 20 years, we'll be, we'll be having new emerging technologies and you can be sure it's not going to be artificial intelligence it's going to be something else i think some time ago we we're talking about nanotechnology right i think we've, we've lived through all of that now uh, we can should we be regulating individuals human being human activity yes because we live in society because yes there are biases that um uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask you as a fellow lawyer is who is developing artificial intelligence technology for who? If it's the, the, the Silicon Valley uh, middle-aged white male, then the African female elderly person might be in danger because they are two worlds apart, mentally, intellectually, technologically. Uh, uh, one of the things we are proposing with the, one of the principles of the contract for the web is that we, we, apart from respecting um, privacy and personal data, is that we develop technologies that support the best in humanity and challenge the worst. Uh, we, you cannot sit down at this time to, to write ABC of what you want to regulate in a certain technology, but you, we can give clear, um, uh, clear views and clear directives about what we know it's detrimental to humanity, and let developers know that. Listen, you have young developers who are 20, 21 years of age, right? They've always had a smartphone since they, they could talk. Uh, they've always had enough coffee. They've always had enough food. They've always had enough of most of the things you talk about. So when, when, you, when you have such people developing technology for the 70-year-old um, farmer, in Nepal, in Nigeria, in Kenya. They don't think the same way. And that is why you have to put down a certain kind of regulation, uh, directives, so that people know that whether you are the one de developing the technology, the people who are using it are going to be different from you. And we begin to um, focus on the needs of human being. With all apologies to men, men developers kind of put ego in code. How many women know that? That when men develop code, ego is a big part of it. 
But when women develop code, utility is what drives solving problems. Men still want to solve problems, but they kind of want to leave their signature in the source code. You should read source code, everyone to know that. So guys, you need to like go down on the code, or go down on the ego, and let's code for what solves problems, and solves problems for everyone in every language, irrespective of their economic capacity. That is also very important. Uh, professor, uh, would you like to uh, respond on uh, uh, regulation perspective of AI? Yeah, yeah this uh, becomes this is really very new uh, issue, uh, and uh, will change a whole a uh, lot about the society, economics, uh, and uh, uh, social, uh, uh, social actions for everybody, I think. So, uh, uh, so th this is a new order. Uh, for the society. Mm -hmm. So we have to s thinking about that advanced, not late, uh, advanced, especially for the developing countries. Uh, how you how use the advantages of the AI for the society? Uh, we, we, we think about the sustainable development goals. We link, so we should link this uh, we, from China experience, uh, we feel that it is a uh, uh, fundamental and the scientific uh, uh, fun, fun foundations should be very important. Uh, technology should be very important. So for developing countries, I think the, no, uh, not only the government, but uh, uh, all the sectors, uh, education, uh, research, and uh, company, private sectors, all the focus on the uh, do right things and the benefit the people and the prevent the bad things. We need uh, thinking about that because uh, artificial uh, intelligence is need, they are balancing, they are something good, something not good. So we need thinking about these uh, advantages. So we thinking from the United Nations, uh, the, the the community. So I think it should be we thinking about the principles for the AI development. So use these advantages, avoid the disadvantages, and especially uh, I agree with the professor uh, the, from Nepal that said that uh, AI uh, create a new uh, digital divide. This is possible, and it's very clear. Is uh, uh, so in this case, so developing countries, and they should uh, pay more attention about the education, capacity building. So otherwise, is always, uh, always uh, is the, 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 the couldn't catch these advantages. So this is my opinion about this. Open the floor. Uh, one, one, two, three. I'll, I'll take three first and then thank you. Please uh, say your name and uh, for the record. Thank you uh, for the opportunity. My name is Fiorlausi. I currently PhD student at the Universidad de Barcelona. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, presentation from all of you. and. Because like there are uh, discussion here about the uh, legal and ethics and AI, so before we decide to regulate and how we regulate, uh, from the law perspective, legal perspective, uh, how do you can you give us like the uh, where we are the process of the independency of uh, AI now and in the future because uh, from when we uh, when we uh, in the, in the law we need to have a clear legal relationship so that we can uh, distinguish the to what extent is the obligation to what extent is the rights uh, in the ecosystem itself so I uh, would like to know about the independency of AI so that uh, and then maybe we can refer to the present case where, for example, there is a, I don't know, accident or any misuse or any, uh, I don't know, inaccurate uh, 
data processing as well, for example, or maybe in a, in autonomous car when it hits somebody. Uh, how do you uh, well, how do we tackle this, especially from the uh, law perspective? Yeah, and then I want to know more about the example of what has been done in China uh, to tackle. Uh, job uh, challenge which are uh, produced by AI. As we understood that the population of uh, China is the biggest in one country around the world, and I believe that's one of the most uh, factor in China who can uh, disrupt your economy is how to ensure that people earn the money. So how do you do that? And then last but not least, do you think that the face of the AI technology now do you think it's already uh, the technology is already spread out uh, diversely, or is it still like actually concentrated in some area? Because even the internet is now already being used, integrated in many parts around the world. Apparently, it's still not 100%. I don't know the the exact percentage of the how many people who use the internet, but I don't think it's maybe close 80%. Maybe I heard like just 50% or even before below so how do you tackle this because if the technology keep uh, keep increasing but uh, people who are left behind never get the chance it will just creating more gap the poorest become poorer the rich become the richer thank you thank you my name is Steve Fosley from uh, from UNICEF so thank you very much to the panelists I, I wanted to get your thoughts on the role of policy in protecting jobs <coughs> and I think that there's two ways we can look at this. The one is that AI is happening, it will continue to happen, and we need to keep feeding it and push it as far as we can. Um, but as you were saying, Madam, in, in China, then it falls to education to prepare humans to live in this AI world. And I worry that we put too much on education, that maybe we'll be asking too much because Obviously, humans can't compete with AI on many things. I mean, humans can't compete with, uh, with simple Excel in terms of running numbers and adding up and running formulas. And we don't need to. You know, we, we've learned to work well with Excel, and if you're an accountant, that's your, you know, that's your ultimate tool. But if we, if we only, if we say that AI is, is happening and we don't actually take a step back, um, education may not be able to, to compete. And so what are your thoughts in China, I'd be interested, but perhaps others, on kind of, on, on policy stepping in and saying, okay, let's, let's, let's hold it. Thank you. On this side. Thank you. Um, I'm Adeo Santososo. I am a member of the UNESCO Commerce Group. And my question is to the colleague from Africa. Uh, you said that uh, in Africa, uh, speaking several languages is uh, quite common, and you said that uh, artificial intelligence can help multilingualism. I think this is very important, but I wonder what you are thinking about. You are thinking about automatic translations or other devices or techniques for Im improving and encouraging multilingualism. Thank you. Uh, I'll be very brief uh, on uh, just uh, one of the questions uh, from uh, UNICEF. Uh, basic, basic income proposal. Uh, I think uh, we already went through uh, you know, evolution from uh, pure capitalism under which uh, you know, many people were uh, excluded from the uh, benefits of capitalism. So uh, many European countries turn to welfare or socialism. Uh, and now AI will replace capital uh, as it's, uh, you know, kind of a, uh, with its constant, with, uh, with its force of uh, uh, concentrating wealth. Well, then we will intensify welfare uh, efforts. So as uh, my slide said, education and welfare. Um, and I think, and also, you know, it will create uh, other jobs. It will create new jobs that didn't exist, um, you know, uh, pre-AI. Uh, uh, if you look at the change of jobs uh, from 
uh, industrial age into uh, you know next uh, revolution, uh, next industrial revolution, uh, you know new jobs were created uh, as uh, more people were you know chased out of uh, exploited exploited work working conditions and uh, uh, wages. So I, I think the answer, answer the answer is there. The problem is execution. Uh, and, and also, Amen. just just personally, uh, as I said before, I was pulled in last minute to uh, fill the uh, fill the uh, empty panel uh, empty panelist spot. So uh, I, I had a prior engagement. So I have to leave at 10:45. So if you, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, quick one, uh, gentlemen. There is already a partnership for AI. It's been created. It's got Amazon. It's got Facebook, Google. Microsoft, IBM, Apple, that partnership already exists. So there is a kind of thing. Yes, we are the 50-50 connection um, balance at this moment. And actually, that's why we launched this hashtag for the web campaign to be able to encourage everyone. Please sign up to the principles for the contract for the web if you have not done so. Happy to talk about it. But we cannot be doing AI for half the world when the, the other part is offline. And that is one of the things I'm passionate about at the Web Foundation. In Africa, or in everywhere in the world, I don't know who cares about AI as artificial intelligence. We don't care about the technology itself. What we care is that the technology facilitates life, right? We want to see it in the devices. We want to see it in public service. We want to see it in making life easy. So it's not just in translation, but the translation bits may not come out in front of my phone, but the work has been done somewhere else. The work could be done in announce six, uh, announce, announcements. The work could be done in, uh, in health, at the health uh, the, when, when I want to speak to a doctor, the, the, the technology would have already happened. So my, my point here is that human beings don't want to speak to other human beings. I mean, I, I still want to go to a bank, and if something is wrong, I want to be able to yell at somebody, kind of, right? That's the human part of me. I'm like, my money is here. I want my money. Why are you making my life difficult? I don't, I mean, a machine would, sorry, could you say that again? Fuck! Oh, sorry, this is UN. We shouldn't be saying that. <laughs> but the thing is, we want to deal with human beings. We still, we want to see things move nicely. So the technology comes at the back end to make things work more. Better. So it do, it's not something about Africa, it's the whole world over. Uh, besides the education in China, is the legal uh, the, the issues, uh, legislation issues, the government should pay more attention about this. Uh, although the, I think this is on the, on the way, uh, although the, uh, the formal uh, legal uh, uh, about the AI is not coming, uh, but uh, uh, the AI is uh, related with the uh, four uh, uh, specific uh, aspect. One is big data. Second is behavior, human behavior. Third one is uh, uh, cloud computing uh, or we can the uh, e-computing. And the uh, third one is high speed uh, communication. So, but China has a very uh, serious legal system uh, 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 managing the four different issues. So I think that's uh, uh, no, no, no uh, of course there are some risk of, about the AI uh, development. Uh, but uh, uh, I don't think uh, in China has a big uh, 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 trouble about that. Uh, but uh, when the new, uh, new events comes and the new challenging comes and then uh, the, the different session can work together to propose the, how to deal with this. Of course, the, right, right now, uh, everybody pay more attention about the how use the AI advantages to help uh, uh, themselves, economic, education, research, uh, other business, and, and I think it's go this way. Uh, of course, I think this is a need uh, uh, international uh, communication and uh, to, uh, to inter interact and how in different country and have, uh, have different issues, how dealing with this. So in, uh, I, I believe that the international cooperation is also very important for, for China. So welcome and uh, 
everybody to uh, in the AI aspect of cooperation with China. I think it's an opportunity for everybody. Thank you. Uh, Priyatos, any uh, remote questions there? No. So. Oh, so considering uh, the limitation of uh, time of his speakers, uh, Nana is also uh, directly going to the airport. So uh, I'd like to thank all of you uh, in the dais and uh, all of you uh, uh, in the uh, uh, participating in this uh, discussion and uh, supporting uh, technical team. And I would like to thank uh, Asia Pacific School on Internet Governance and uh, Professor Chon to provide uh, this opportunity to me uh, to come here and uh, organize this workshop. Uh, thank you very much.